It's great to see everyone this evening as we are coming to the last of our Get Divorce Savvy panels. They have been outstanding and a big shout out to Lisa Zinerman for pulling this together and working with us at Savvy Ladies to really bring the expertise of, um, of all of the, these topics to the forefront for us and our volunteers and our clients. Everyone knows Savvy Ladies. I'm the executive director, Judy Herbst. We're a nonprofit this year. We're celebrating our 20th year as an organization where we support financial knowledge for women. Um, at the key of what we do is our free financial helpline. And it is powerful now that we are connecting over 2,000 women last year. We're going to hit 3,000, if not exceed that this year. So if you have a question that is not answered this evening, that is a personal financial question, please go to our helpline and we can match you with that volunteer expert to really help you further along in your financial journey and answer that question for you. Um, tonight is really a really exciting and very, very timely conversation to understand are you being spied on? Spied on? What does that mean? How to find it out and how to explore that? What questions are the right questions to ask? And how to just keep your privacy to yourself? What does that mean? I really want to thank tonight's sponsor of our panel series discussion tonight, Nick. Him in, I'm going to mess it up, but Mick, Nick, thank you so much um, with the NGH group. He'll be joining us um, and sharing his expertise on his, his style of investigating. Um, Lisa Ziderman, I'd love to introduce you. You know you are a savvy rock star for us. You um, are our vice president on our board and really are a mover and shaker. It is really my pleasure to welcome you tonight as our moderator and for you to introduce our panelists. Sure. So welcome, everyone. We're really excited to do this tonight. This is the last of our Divorce Savvy series, um, and we're very excited to introduce Nick Jimenez. I think I got that right. Did I, Nick? Very close, Lisa. Okay. Jimenez. <laughs> okay. And Philip Siegel, and um, I've known both of them for a very long time. Nick is um, got a very special expertise. He is actually has 30 years of experience in fraud investigations, and most importantly, in computer forensics. So Nick is our go-to um, firm when we have someone who calls us up and says, I, I believe that my spouse is got access to my computer. They seem to know exactly what I'm doing. They know, know what I've written to you, or they know what I've been saying on the phone. I feel like someone is tracking me. Um, I'm not really sure. Is it possible that someone has access? And at that point, we ask them certain questions, which we'll talk about tonight with Nick. And then sometimes we pick up the phone and we call Nick and we'll talk tonight about how to do that properly with what's called a Covell agreement as well. Um, and then we have Philip Siegel and Philip is our go-to expert for um, finding assets. So Philip has an interesting background. He was a journalist in India, Pakistan, and he ran NBC's Mexico City um, Bureau. Um, he actually is the person who I go to to find these hidden assets. If I have um, a question, whether someone actually hasn't been straight about their discovery or their documentation or their statements of net worth, um, Philip is someone that we can go to and he can do some interesting searches for assets. And we'll be talking about that with him as well. So, um, Nick, I'm going to start out with you um, tonight. Can you tell us what a forensic computer expert is? Sure. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I'm happy to talk about uh, these topics. Um, I, I was talking about very similar topics just yesterday on Valentine's Day, which uh, I thought was a little odd, but here we are. Um, yeah, uh, as a computer forensic expert, um, as as you know, we've worked with your firm many times. We're oftentimes looking for uh, information, data, or information uh, in uh, a party's device that the court has perhaps ordered to be produced or searched, or these kind of things. But as you indicated, we're very often working um, defensively to uh, investigate whether or not 
your clients or our clients' uh, devices or accounts associated with those devices, which literally everyone has these days, right? Uh, at least some devices and accounts of some kind. Some people have an awful lot. Um, and uh, people are frequently very concerned about uh, whether, it, particularly in the context of a divorce or custody battle, whether the other side is gaining access to those. And we take our forensic investigative skill set uh, that we use to find information and we use it defensively to determine whether or not those accounts and, and devices have been hacked or as we say compromised um, but if I get a chance I'll explain the difference how we use those two terms but that's basically what it is. Okay, so let's let's talk about those differences. Um, so first of all, you said that this there's two two sides to what you do. You can work defensively, or I guess you can work offensively. And so tell me what you do um, in terms of, I, I call you up, Nick, and I say, um, I've got a situation where I don't believe that somebody is being honest about um, their assets. And I believe all the data is on the computer. And I've got, I'm going to go into court now and I'm going to get an order for them to turn over their computer. So can you talk to us about that and, and how you work with, with those, those clients sure. first of all? Sure. Um, so, and, and it happens frequently, uh, sometimes even before the filing of the divorce, but in your example, after the filing of the divorce, you feel the financial disclosure hasn't been appropriate or, or complete. And uh, we would work with you um, to uh, uh, prepare and you file you know, a, a motion to the court to uh, for what we call discovery and inspection of OPDs. That's our term, the OPDs part. It's the other party's devices, right? That's our shorthand. So you're basically asking the court to force the other party to produce their business and personal computing devices and access to their accounts that may have relevant financial data in them, right? Um, we will make some arrangement to go to the party in question or have them come to us and we will do something called forensically imaging their devices, which is basically to make a, a verifiable and complete forensic copy of all the data on their device. Um, and we'll do the same thing functionally by accessing their email account, iCloud account, et cetera, as per whatever the court has permitted us to do and collect and preserve all that data uh, in a verifiable uh, way uh, so that we can testify about it and authenticate it later. And then to get to the heart of it, um, what we are going to do is then index and search all of that data, including lots and lots of data that the person whose devices uh, we just imaged uh, don't even know is there anymore, or they deleted, but th they don't realize it's not really gone and it's still recoverable. And, you know, a lot of the juicy stuff we find that, you know, you in that circumstance might be interested in is, you know, the deleted financial statements, the deleted documents regarding the ownership of some asset that they didn't disclose, et cetera. Um, and um, it sounds like an incredibly invasive process, uh, for the party whose devices and accounts we're doing that to. And in some regard, it can be, but as you know well, because we've done this many times, there are safeguards put in place by, by the court or you set them up in advance in, in, in the papers that you and your lawyers file where we're getting all this data, but then we're searching it and we don't give you, the lawyers, literally everything that's on there because the vast majority of what's on there is probably going to be irrelevant. We're only producing the specific uh, information and data to you that's relevant to the financial issues that you asked the court to let us look for the data about. Um, and that's basically how it works in the offensive sense. Okay. Now, you mentioned that um, you do it per a court order. 
Um, what are the limitations in doing, doing it without a court order? So um, somebody calls you up and says that they want their spouse's computer to be um, copied, I guess, is, is what you would say, correct? Yeah. Um, yeah. To be For the hard drive, I guess, to be copied. And the question becomes, can you do that without a court order? And what are the limitations? So the short answer is, um, and this varies a lot from state to state. And um, forgive me, I'm not sure, you know, if most uh, or all of the folks on the call are in New York or they may be in lots of other states. Um, so this can vary a lot from state to state. But for example, in New York, um, there are, uh, yes, you can do it. Um, there are s certainly some uh, some rules you need to follow to make sure that you're doing it in circumstances where it is legal and you have to be very careful. We have a company policy. In, in this situation that you're describing, if the client calls us directly and says, I want you to come in and you know image the computer, especially if they start using buzzwords like my husband's laptop, um, we have to be very careful. Our, this is not the law, this is our rule. We're not, we need your, your attorney's phone number, or we need to get your attorney involved here, because as you said before, Coval, protecting privilege, et cetera. And we have to make sure this is being done correctly and properly, even without a court order. So um, the answer is yes, we can do it um, under certain circumstances. It's legal, depending on what state you're in. Um, and the, the, the very, very key distinction is this. If there is a computing device in the marital residence, and either party would routinely have physical access to that device, then generally speaking, yes, that's going to be permissible for us to do what we call clandestine imaging or covertly secretly come in and copy that computer. Um, but it, it, again, you know, it, it, all of the facts and circumstances have to be looked at by counsel before we would go ahead and, you know, make the determination that yes, it's, it's okay and appropriate for us to do that. And I, I have to just say one more thing right there, which is that does not mean that it's ever okay or permissible to say, oh, well, it would be okay to copy the other party's computer. So I'm going to put some spyware on their computer or, I'm going to put some spyware on their phone or I'm going to hack their iCloud account and intercept their text messages, et cetera. Because all those things I just mentioned are illegal in almost every circumstance and can get people into a lot of trouble. Okay. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. And we're going to go back to that. So I want to explain what a Covell agreement is, because I think that it's a very important um, mechanism for what we call privilege. And essentially, and Nick, you'll 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 tell me if you disagree with what I'm saying, but Not likely. Co, co, well, you might. But Covell was actually a case, and it, it then became um known as a Covell agreement. And it is where your attorney hires the expert. Your attorney actually is the client in that particular case. And the reason that your attorney is the client is then your attorney would have actually privilege with either Nick or Philip, okay, or another expert that you hire. And so what you what your attorney and your expert learn are between your attorney and your expert. Your attorney then fills you in, but the expert is there to help the attorney understand the material. And that's a very important distinction because that is the crux of the Covell agreement is that this is actually the, the expert is essentially there to help your attorney to understand the information and that, and you are no longer the client or you are not the client of the expert. You are the client of your attorney and the expert has his client, which is your attorney. And so although it seems like it's an extra step, it's a very important step to maintain privilege. Do you agree with that, Nick? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because look, um, uh, uh, as licensed private investigators in New York, I'm also licensed PI in Connecticut. The work we do for a client who walks in off the street to hire us directly without their attorney it's confidential under law, meaning I can't disclose it without the client's permission, et cetera. 
But if someone serves a subpoena on me, that confidentially go, uh, confidentiality goes out the window. And then I have to respond to the subpoena if it's a valid subpoena um, and produce information or whatever is being asked for. But uh, under the circumstances you described, if I'm engaged by the attorney to do the work on the case, and that's documented, as you said, with the Covell agreement, then that we can, you know, the attorney can respond to that subpoena. I send them the subpoena and they can respond to it and say, nope, this is legally privileged. It's not just confidential. And we've had that happen, you know, plenty of times. Exactly. Exactly. So you talked about spyware. Can you explain what spyware is? Uh, I can, and um, I will. Uh, I will say uh, as 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 much as I can. And I have been shouting from the mountaintops about uh, both the dangers of spyware to you know your audience as potential victims, and the dangers to everyone in the audience as uh, for getting in very serious trouble if they use spyware. And I've been talking about that for a long time. Um, I got a big, uh, big boost. And I have to give a shout out to the New York State Attorney General's office, who there was just a press release this month, February 2023. Um, you know, uh, they finally did something about uh, the spyware, or at least, you know, took a, a big bite out of the problem. Um, spyware is basically what it sounds like it's an app or a computer program um, that you deploy install on the other party's cell phone ipad uh laptop what have you um you know and there are hundreds of different spyware apps and and programs etc um, but basically their defining characteristic is you install them once installed they are the good ones are very, very, very good at running in the background undetected and unbeknownst to the person whose device it is. And they're literally gathering, usually in real time, everything that's being done on that device, text messages, uh, social media posts, WhatsApp messages, emails, uh, call logs, internet searches and internet uh, browser history, GPS location. And in the case of the most insidious spyware apps, um, which by the way, is what the New York Attorney General in large part cracked down on very recently and did the pre press release about, uh, about six or seven different uh, spyware apps um, that were being marketed and sold specifically, by the way, by the people selling them saying, uh, you can use this to catch your cheating spouse or, you know, use this to covertly get information uh, from your spouse's device, which is a classy felony in New York, but they weren't telling anybody that. And that's part of why the attorney general went after them. Um, but uh, so in, in the case of some of the really insidious and effective spyware apps that, that we've seen and know about, including some of the ones they just cracked down on, um, they can actually allow the bad actor who installed it to listen in and record the victim's phone calls. And even in some cases, click a button and turn on the microphone of the victim's device, even when they're not talking on the phone and effectively turn the victim's iPhone into a bug and listen in to whatever conversation, you know, the victim, a uh, spouse could be sitting, Lisa, in your office having a meeting with you about the case, and the bad spouse who installed the spyware on their iPhone could click a button. They could know that they're there because they're tracking the GPS on the phone and say, oh, look, my wife is at uh, her attorney's office. Let me click the button and listen to what they're saying. That's literally how bad some of this spyware can be. And I have to say, we have had this happen, actually. Yes. And um, 
unfortunately. And we have had, um, there have been arrests actually because of that. We've we've learned that it's happened and there have been investigations, et cetera, because of it. And, and there were arrests because of it. So it is a very serious crime. It's not something for sure to put on anyone's computer. And if you think that it is on yours, then you should be speaking to your attorney if you feel like it's on your devices. Um, so Nick, is there any way for people to know, I used to um, remember um, clients would say that they would like their, their phone was flashing sometimes, or what are some of the signals, if any, um, or, or is it just become so much more sophisticated now well, that, that there are no signals? The answer is there sometimes are. I mean, that's the problem. There are sometimes are, right? So there are red flags that if a person calls and says, you know, um, uh, my all of a sudden my phone was fine, but now all of a sudden my battery's dying in like every three hours. It used to last all day. That's a red flag that there's spyware running in the background because it uses up a lot of resources and a lot of battery power uh, much faster than the phone otherwise would. That's a red flag. And there are lots of other things, like you said, occasionally you may get glitches on the phone because the spyware is on there and running and because of what the person who put the spyware on the phone to get the, the, really, the really bad types of spyware, to put them on the Android or the, uh, or the iPhone, for example, you have to uh, do something else first called rooting or jailbreaking of the device. And that often causes the glitches and things you're referring to, like, oh, all of a sudden my email app doesn't work. It like glitches out like every five minutes or my browser doesn't work right. Um, that That's a red flag, but those don't always happen. Um, and that's the problem, you know, just because none of those things is happening doesn't mean there's not necessarily spyware or some uh, malicious app uh, running on the phone. There could be and not really have any outward signs. So, you know, it, it's it's the kind of thing where if you have a reason, forget about what's going on on the phone. If the client has a reason to suspect that there might be spyware on the phone, for example, hey, I texted Lisa yesterday, you know, and I said, um, you know, X, Y, Z. And now the next day or the day after my estranged spouse made a comment to me and knew like almost the exact words that I used in my text to Lisa. That's really strange. That is a red flag. That's not something, you know, happening on the phone. That's just a red flag, you know, that you might notice and, and <laughs> those types of things, or, or they had a phone call with you. And something was repeated back to them. You know, we've literally had clients call and say, this is unbelievable. My uh, my estranged spouse just confronted me and said, you told your lawyer, blah, 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 blah. And repeated almost verbatim, you know, what the party had told you on the phone the day before. If that happens, there is more than likely, you know, a problem you know, with some kind of spyware on your on your phone or one of your devices. Or you're speaking too loudly, folks. OK, yeah. and and or you've got somebody on speakerphone. I mean, there are, um, you know, I, I will say that some of the times that people come to us, the reasons are so obvious that and, and people don't necessarily think about it, but they're either speaking too loudly or they're speaking on speakerphone, or maybe they haven't password protected their um, met their devices and they've left them open. And so you you and I have had cases like that, Nick, where people have yep. just left the in, left the devices open like an open filing cabinet, and therefore. Um, you know, the question becomes whether or not your spouse can actually then look at that computer because and and those documents that are on that computer and your open emails that are sitting on that computer. So that brings me to the the question, what are the three things people can do immediately to secure their devices? Well, uh, first and foremost, to the extent that We've gotten to a point, I think pretty much everyone, where 
you know, our smartphone is like an extension of our hand, right? And whatever other devices we may or may not be using, the smartphone that we all have is at the heart of almost everything we do. Um, so that has to be secure. Um, it has to have a lock code on it. Um, and again, a lot of what I'm going to say now, you know, it's not just good general advice. It's really specific to, hey, I'm in a high risk scenario. I'm going through a divorce, a custody battle where there's going to be one or I just got out of one, et cetera. Right. Um, so there, uh, not everything I'm, I'm going to say now you know, applies to everyone in every situation, but there's got to be a lock code on the phone. It should be a minimum of a six digit lock code, which almost every smartphone gives you that option instead of a four digit code. And absolutely positively can't and should be anything that the other party can guess or figure out like kids' birthdays, kids' birthdays backwards, blah, blah, nothing like that. Um, and that may seem very obvious, but here's the one that's maybe not so obvious. The lock code is only good if the phone is locked with the code. What does that mean? Well, people talk, oh, I have a six digit lock code on the phone that my you know, uh, estranged spouse could never guess. It's impossible. Fine, no problem. Um, and by the way, if people ask this all the time. You know, the Android and, 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 and the uh, current iPhones, if they're locked and the other party doesn't know or can't figure out the unlock code, those devices are extraordinarily secure. It is extraordinarily difficult, almost impossible to get into them if you don't have the unlock code, which brings us back to that's only helpful if the device is locked, which means you've got to go into settings and you've got to set the auto lock feature, not for five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, but for 30 seconds or, you know, or a minute at the absolute most. And you have to get into the habit has to become habit like breathing that every time you put the phone down, you're hitting that button to lock it. You put it down on the kitchen counter because you got to go in the other room. You have to be locking the phone and have that auto lock feature set for a very short period of time. That is absolutely key. Um, uh, the other thing, and, and again, I've had cases like this. I can't remember whether any of them was with your office. I suspect one of them might have been. Do not, do not enable fingerprint or facial recognition. Why? Because we've literally had real life cases where the bad actor spouse can't get into the phone they want to look at. So they wait till the victim spouse who happens to be a hard sleeper or, or a, a deep sleeper is sleeping and they put their thumb, they take the phone and they put the spouse's thumb on the phone or hold it up to their face. The facial recognition doesn't really work so good if the person sleep, but it could. Um, but the fingerprint one, we've had multiple cases where we're absolutely positively sure that's how the person got in. They put the thumb on. So disable those things, incredibly important. Um, and if the person suspects, if, if, if the person suspects for any reason that the phone has spyware on it, in addition to calling their lawyer to get some help and figure out what to do, they need to immediately put the phone in airplane mode and turn off Wi-Fi. Back in the day, if you turned a phone on airplane mode, it turned off Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. In addition to cutting off cellular connections, etc., it doesn't do that anymore because Everyone wants to use their phone on the airplane. And the airplanes now have Wi-Fi. So when you turn the phone on airplane mode, most modern smartphones in the last couple of years, that doesn't kill Wi-Fi. You've got to turn airplane mode on, manually turn off Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and then start going about, you know, getting in touch with your lawyer and figuring out what to do next. Interesting. That 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 I never heard before, Nick. So that is a great hint because we get those um, clients who call us and they would need to know what to do before I can reach out to you. And now I know exactly what to do. Um, 
So there's a, a couple of questions in the chat already. Um, so one question is, can you explain the difference between a device being hacked and being compromised? Is there a difference between those two things? Uh, there is in, in our parlance. And, and frankly, I think, you know, in, you know, in, in legal and tech, technical usage, yes. And he, he, here's the difference. Um, compromised means just that. The, the information or data on that device or in that account, which is where we see it a lot, has been accessed by some party who does not have authorization to access it, has no legal right to access it. It's compromised, period. Hacking to us involves someone having gotten in through some technical means. That may sound like a fuzzy distinction, but let me clear it right up. People call us all the time, lawyers included, uh, and say, my client's iCloud was hacked. Client sells, it was hacked. And in many of, those case, many of those cases, it turns out their iCloud or whatever cloud account was indeed compromised. But I can tell you that in 99.9% .9 of those cases, and not just mine, everyone else's key cases, no one hacked the iCloud server at Apple, right? Has it ever happened? Yeah, there have been a couple of hacking incidents over the years that were documented, but generally speaking, no one's hacking into there. What happened was the bad actor got a hold of the victim's account credentials, their Apple ID and their password, and they got into the account. The account is compromised, but nobody hacked the iCloud account. We're look, and there's a difference to us because we're looking for something different. When we see, oh, this iCloud account was definitely compromised, there's some factual evidence or real world evidence to support that. We don't start looking for the vector, we call it, or the mechanism by which the, uh, the iCloud was actually hacked, because we know we'd be wasting our time. We start looking for how did the bad spouse obtain or get a hold of the victim spouse's credentials to get into the account. So that's kind of the distinction. Okay. I'm going to come back to you, Nick, in a few minutes. I want to ask Philip a few questions, if I may, Philip. Yeah. Um, so here's a question. When you are actually um, looking for assets, what do you do to go to make sure that, first of all, what you're doing is legal, Okay. And second of all, where are the places that you look? We just talked about um, from Nick that perhaps somebody's computer might be a place, but what do you do to explain to us? Okay, sure. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, we look, we try and turn over every piece of public information that we can find about a person. And when I say public, I mean things that I'm entitled to see. So I'm not going to be looking at someone's bank account information because I'm not supposed to get that without a court order. Uh, but I can look at someone's mortgages where someone owns property. I can look at liens. I can look at securities records. I can look at their social media. However, if their social media is locked to anyone but friends, I can't look at it because I'm not allowed ethically to, to pretend to be you or to pretend to be the New York Times or whoever it is. So... Um, Whatever is legal and ethical to look at, that's what I'm going to look at. And it's funny because privacy means different things to different people in different places. Uh, in the United States, uh, someone's old uh, divorce agreement is open in certain states. In New York, it's sealed. In Maryland, wide open. In Georgia, wide open. I can look at a guy's divorce and see that there was an agreement on visiting the pets. I mean, I, I had that case, and I can see that. In New York, you can't see that because it's all sealed. In Norway, people's income tax returns are public, uh, but you could never look at a court case about their divorce or, you know, an order of protection that they sought, anything like that, not allowed. So wherever we're looking, wherever it's, whatever state it is, whatever country it is, it's always what we're allowed to get. And that's the main, so we don't ever, people say, do you invade someone's privacy? 
And my answer is no, because privacy is defined by the law as to what you're allowed to look at, and that's what I look at. But it, if I can get it, licensing agreements, uh, licensing, uh, licensing information, professional uh, licensing, uh, uh, stock, uh, securities information, uh, lobbying records, electoral contributions, charitable – someone has a charity, the tax return of that charity is public information. I look at that. Anything I can see – now, I've, I've put people together. We think this guy is funding this, gra this AstroTurf campaign against our company, and I put that together with lobbying records to say, yes, the, the, the AstroTurf campaign against is really – it's based at the house of your major competitor, and we've figured out through lobbying records. There's so much in the United States that's public – the question is, where do you go find it? That's the trick, because some things are at county level, some things are at state level, some things are federal, uh, some things are at an agency level somewhere. And so that's really the, the art about where do you look and, and uh, where do you start looking, and then what trails do you follow? And are there certain databases that you, you utilize that others can't, or are there databases that you use frequently in order to find information? Yes, uh, there are. Yes to both. Uh, although any database that I use, you could use as a lawyer. Uh, the thing is that the databases are, are just starting points. Uh, you know, I would never take a finding from a database and report that as a finding. Uh, because databases get a lot of things wrong. They don't talk to each other. So one database won't be sufficient. But, you know, Westlaw, one of the best-known databases, thinks I still own my house in Westchester that I sold 10 years ago. Why? Because I still use my little CVS discount card that I got at CVS when I lived there, and I still use the card or put in my old phone number that someone else uses now. And CBS continues to sell that information to Westlaw. So Westlaw thinks that I still own the house. Westlaw also notes that I own another house, so it thinks I own two houses. So I would never report a situation like that. I would then go to the <coughs> public records to see, do I still own that house or not? Uh, and if you go to the Westchester clerk, you'll see that I sold that house. Although, uh, you have to spell my name a different way because there's a typo in the record. So you have to be a bit creative about looking at, well, that maybe then I would go to the assessor and see who's the owner of record on the, on the property. But there, those are the kinds of things that, that, uh, that I do. And I do use a few of the databases. Um, some, some are open to anyone who wants to pay for them, LexisNexis for newspapers, for example. But they're just a starting point. Now, you talked about social media. And we um, tend to warn our clients to be very careful about posting on social media during a divorce. Um, what, what's your feeling about that? Is there a reason that they should be cautious about posting on, on social media? And what do you look for on social media in terms of um, when you're on a divorce case? I look for where they're going, who they're with. Um, you know, some, and I don't always see in the divorce proceedings all of the assertions of the other side. I, I mean, a lawyer will brief me and say, okay, we think this guy, usually I'm looking for assets of a guy, but it can be the other way around and same sex and everything. But let's say the wife, you, you're representing the wife, and you say, okay, she thinks the husband is, goes here, goes there, uh, maybe has stuff some money in with a friend of his on a handshake deal, and he'll get the money back later. Uh, anything, anything that I, anything I see, I just report it because I don't always know what's going to be interesting, what's going to contradict. Uh, but if, if the certainly if the person says, "Well, I haven't left the country in three years," uh, and we see that he, he left the country lots of times because here he is water skiing in the Cayman Islands six months ago, that's of interest. And, and as soon as someone is lying about anything, they could be lying about something else, I think. So the one thing about social media that's interesting, though, is that you have to look not just at the person, but the person's friends. And supposing this person has locked his social media, you can't see anything. But you know this is his best friend, this guy over here. That guy, that guy over there, maybe he doesn't really post anything on Facebook, so he won't be of use. But 
oftentimes the spouse will. And this is the great thing about social media. You know, if you if you know who his spouse is and she has an active account and she's posting all sorts of stuff, she might have the photograph of our guy and her husband, his friend, all the three of them together in the Cayman Islands. So off and sometimes when I do background checks on big CEOs that run, you know, Fortune 100 companies, these guys are very careful and they don't have a Facebook account. They don't have Instagram, but but their wives do and their teenage children do. And there they are. You know, they have a 19 year old kid who goes to, to Duke and there they are at a Duke football game drinking. Maybe the guy's not supposed to be drinking, whatever it is. So I, I like to go in on any investigation with a somewhat open mind because we know, we think we're going to find something, but if we prescribe too quickly what we're looking for, we have this confirmation bias and we, we don't really look because we think we're not going to find it. So I take whatever it is the client thinks I'm going to find, and I have that in the back of my mind, but then I'm always mindful that I wouldn't be there on the, on the clock if we knew everything. So we sometimes there are great surprises. You you give a client a, a big you say actually you know uh, you're not wife number two you're wife number three that's happened. You know there's all sorts of fun surprises that you uh, that you could give to people by being open minded and saying well this looks like our guy who had a one year marriage in New Jersey from 2004 2005 but he's only been married twice including this one so it can't be him. But it's my duty to go and look at the records and make sure that's not him. Because if it is him, well, maybe that first wife is someone interesting we could talk to about where he used to do things, where he used to bank, who else he knows. And, and when you want to, if it's enough money at stake, you want to go talk to that person. And ex-wives are wonderful people to talk to if, they, if they'll talk to you. And ex-girlfriends and, and, and yep. ex-boyfriends and, and yeah. ex-husbands. Yeah. So yes, no, I agree with that. And I think that's a very interesting point about being able to use social media um, in these layered ways that it, it's not just the first layer that you go to the second and the third layer actually to figure this out. And I, I am going to say that this is the reason why we have people like Nick and Philip, because we don't have that expertise, nor frankly, um, do we want to learn all of that on your on on the client's dime? So it's much better, frankly, for you to have a collaborative team of professionals that you're working with and that are actually able to call a Nick or a Philip or um, a Gary Rosen or any of those types of people and be able to work with them collaboratively because you're going to have a much more efficient way of, of learning about the assets and the other things in your divorce. So I think that's really an important point. Um, talk to me, Philip, about um, putting trackers on cars. So we have this all all day long, frankly. People call us and they think that there's trackers on their cars. And I know, Nick, we, we've called you for this too. Um, but Philip, do you put trackers on cars? What's the limitations to this? Um, are there limitations? Tell us about it. Well, there sure are. I mean, you know, uh, until recently, uh, the Supreme Court decided that the state was not allowed to put trackers on anyone's car without a without a warrant. Um now, in, in different states have different rules, and it's changing all the time, but it's getting harder and harder in the United States. I don't know what the current New York rule is, because as Nick said, if someone said to me, I want to put a tracker on someone's car, I would say, get your lawyer on the phone, and he's going to actually ask me to do this. And I don't, I don't actually, any, anyway, I don't follow people, and I don't do that, but when I used to uh, actually manage that sort of thing as opposed to outsourcing it, um, I would I would check the law because uh, in many states now you're not allowed to put a tracker on anyone's car unless it's your your own car. So if it's your own car, yeah, you know maybe maybe it's allowed. Although I don't even know if in all states that that's the rule. Uh, some states are more permissive than others, uh, but it's it's just about as as fraught a situation as taking a laptop and looking at that. You know, and even if you if you say, yeah, yeah, you know, we, we both use the car. Yeah, but if it's his car, if it's, if it's his company's car, leased by his company for his use, um, I'm not so sure I could put a tracker on that uh, to see what he's doing. 
So, I, I think um, that's right. It, it's very delicate, very delicate situation. The other thing that um, I've noticed now is that a lot of um, the car companies offer these apps that you can download on your phone. So I, I will tell a little story. Um, my husband, who I love dearly, okay, one night I was driving home and I had, and he likes to, to make sure I'm safe. So I'm, I'm saying this in all good ways, okay? And all of a sudden the horn and my car is honking. And I'm thinking, I think I just heard the horn honk. And then it happens again. And of course he thought this was very funny, but he had an app on his phone. So are you familiar with those apps, Philip? And, and how do people yeah. know if there's an app on their spouse's phone for the car that they're driving where they're going to actually have the location? Uh, that, that'd be more a question for Nick because I, I don't really examine phones, but I would say that if you can't put a tracker on a on a phone, uh, I would I would wonder whether you'd be able to subpoena the insurance company for the location data. Uh, I mean, you would you would always be able to if you don't have a, and I've I've never looked into the you know I've never seen a case where that would happen, but I don't see why not. You know, if if the data is there and you co-own the car, uh, and it, and it affects your own, and you're paying for part of the insurance for that car and it's there. The reason they give you those things is just so they can see what a good driver you are and give you lower insurance premiums. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think it would be so outrageous to say, okay, we'd like Progressive to give us the data of where of what they saw, because uh, it's actually our data. I mean, it's their data, but it's about us. Um, and you know that might be one workaround toward knowing where people went. Similarly, you know, an Easy Pass account tells you everywhere. You know, everywhere a car has gone through a toll. Um, and again, that's that's not a that's not a locate that's not a tracker. Uh, it's not and it's not real time, but still pretty interesting. If you see if you think he's doing something nefarious in New Jersey and he's going over the George Washington Bridge at three o'clock in the morning, you know, four nights a week when he's supposed to be sleeping right there, this is informative. And and those are our records, by the way, that we uh, we routinely get easy pass records yeah. um, subpoenaed um, or turned over in discovery. And they do sometimes tell quite a bit, um, as do ATM withdrawal um, information where somebody is um, in terms of, you know, when they make that withdrawal on the ATM machine, et cetera. So, Nick, there are a few questions for you in, in sure. the chat. I want to just touch on them. Um, so one is. Um, and and I'm going to try to explain it. So you have a child, your child's device is connected to your device in some way. So it's a family um, iCloud account in some way. And the information, the emails are going back and forth. Um, and so you're able to see your spouse's emails on your child's account and your, and, and your child's able to see God knows what that's coming through the account and your child's iPad becomes um, essentially a fountain of information. Um, I certainly have had this in cases. Have you and tell us about how to prevent I, this? I have had it so often that we have a term for it. We call it iCloud bleed. I've had a couple of cases with your office that involved this where we see it all the time. And I, I had to bite my lip to not <laughs> jump in as you were asking the question, because you said, so the client has this device and um, the child has a device and the two are connected. And I was about to jump in and say, stop right there. Because there's the problem and that can't be. We can't have that because of the things you just said. There are two major problems with this. And I'll tell everyone in just a minute how to avoid it. And it's not that hard. Um, the, the two major problems are this. One, you are using a common Apple ID with your child. I know that sounds logical. And, you know, well, I just put my Apple ID in their, you know, device because I want them to have their own device and they have to be able to download games and do things and whatever. And I didn't want to set up an Apple ID for them. It, it happens constantly uh, so much so that i would say maybe 50 percent of the cases we investigate where the initial complaint is 
oh my God, the other party hacked my iCloud or got my texts, they hacked this, that, et cetera. About half of the cases we investigate turn out to be some variation of iCloud bleed, right? So the two problems are one, you put your Apple ID in the child's device. And now, unbeknownst to you, either you did it by mistake or the device they had was already set up that way by someone else or the child who, quite frankly, and, you know, this is going to sound funny, but most people know it's true. The eight or nine or 10 year old child who probably knows how to use an iPad better than you do clicked on I, uh, settings iCloud and went do, 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 down the list and turned everything on to sync. Your iCloud data is now syncing to your iCloud account and down to the child's device, including text messages, photos, and all kinds of other things. Now child takes that device and goes for weekend visitation with the other spouse. That's a major strategic and practical problem. But as you, Lisa, know well, when the child goes to the other spouse's house for visitation and the other spouse sees the child using the iPad and says, uh, let me see your iPad because I want to see what you're doing. The other spouse has a right to do that, just like you do. And they start seeing all your texts and other kinds of things on there, et cetera. That's a huge problem. But they didn't hack you. Your data has been compromised for sure. But they didn't break the law. They didn't hack you. That's not eavesdropping or interception or or whatever. Um, that's oops, right? And it's a major problem. The other major problem with it is this. Even if that doesn't happen, or even if that can't happen because the other spouse has maybe added a picture, or maybe the child never has visitation with them, or, or never brings the device over there, or what have you, there are things that all of us are doing. And I, I'm not talking about anything really naughty, but there are things that all of us are doing as adults that the child shouldn't be seeing. And certainly there are some things that people do, whether it's visiting websites or sending photos back and forth between other consenting adults. And I'm not judging anyone's conduct as long as it's legal, but we'd all agree as, as a bright line that there's lots of stuff we do as adults and may choose to look at as adults that no 10-year-old child should be seeing. And if you're doing it on your device, there's an excellent chance it may show up on theirs with a shared Apple ID or even the family sharing account if you're not really careful and fastidious about the, the settings and configurations. So the the solution to the problem is simple. If you as a parent have determined that your child of whatever age they may be should have their own iPad, their own iPhone, their own iTouch, whatever, right? You need to, first of all, don't give them any re recycled device from any adult member of the family. Number two, right? Or, or if you do, make absolutely positively sure you've done a correct and proper factory reset on the device, not reset settings, not reset network settings, a full factory reset on the device to wipe it clean. And then when you set it up for the child, make take five minutes and create a free Apple ID account for the child. Okay. That's theirs and theirs exclusively. Now you say, but what if I want to say, you created it. You made up the Apple ID. You know the Apple ID password. You're the parent. You can go log into it anytime you want and see what the child is doing or, or take the device from them and look on the device, et cetera. Never, ever use your grown-up Apple ID on a child's device for both of those very important reasons. And, and Nick is correct. Um, we've had many cases of this. In some cases, I'm going to say we probably prevailed on the case. Um, and in terms of custody cases, certainly because of these, um, these shared accounts, because the information was coming in and the pictures were coming in and um, it was quite a disaster 
for um, for the other side in those cases. So we do warn clients um, that they have to be really careful. Um, sometimes we send them to Nick. Sometimes, frankly, I just send them to Apple because I, I like that's the fastest thing to do at that moment. And um, and hopefully people heed that and they look at their devices and they make sure that they are not being shared with your children because for sure, and your spouse, by the way, in some cases they're shared with the spouse. The stuff is just coming through for the spouse too. So um, the other thing I'm gonna warn about is that if the information is coming through and there are privileged emails or text messages between your spouse and their attorney, do not read them because that becomes a whole other situation. Do not read them. I know it's really tempting. I know you really want to do it sometimes, but it is a bad idea. And it really will not be looked upon fondly by any judge. So be super careful about that. And you must alert your attorney as to what's going on. Um, someone has asked, is it possible for someone to install spyware without having the device in their possession, Nick? The answer is... Yes, in a limited way. Um, if, um, and there's a white paper that we have that talks about this, um, but there is some spyware that can be deployed onto a person's or leveraging a person's iCloud account as opposed to being installed on their device. So the answer to your question is yes. Um, it is not as insidious or devastating to the victim as the other ones I talked about where they could turn the microphone on, uh, record phone calls, et cetera. But if someone is able to gain access to your Apple ID account, i.e. your iCloud, there are a few spyware apps that can be deployed to leverage what's in your iCloud, which depending on what your settings are on your device, could be your text messages, your location data, uh, you know, Safari web history, uh, call logs, uh, and lots of photos, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, it, it tends to be delayed. It's not real time. But, uh, you know, if, um, you know, if someone can get into your iCloud, yes, they can. De they can deploy some some limited type of spyware um, that can be, you know, very damaging. Judy, is it possible to put that in the chat or not? Is that a yes? Okay, you're on mute, so I'm going to assume yes. So we just put up some information that, or Judy's going to put up some information in the chat that Nick had sent us in advance. Um, so that everybody can save it and download it. Philip, I'm going to come back to you um, for a sec for a question here. Um, so um, someone has asked, both parties have access to an Intuit account, but one party has changed the password, locking the other party out and can therefore observe the other's financial activity in real time, credit cards, bank accounts, IRAs, et cetera. Um, can this be done? And what what actually can you do about it? Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, that's not the kind of, because an Intuit account is not a public record. So that's really not the kind of thing I look at, you know. Um, if you can bring, bring an Intuit account to people, uh, to, to like Nick, he, you know, he might be able to see how it was accessed. But I, it's not something that I ever look at, you know. Uh, because it's it's not they don't need me to look at an Intuit account uh, and to judge whether someone improperly locked another person out of it. I, that's not that's not really what I what I do. If you find out information in the Intuit account about assets, about properties, about counterparties, and they say, "Gee, uh, we just noticed that forty thousand dollars a month has been going out to this person. Who is that?" That's when I would be able to 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 help. 
Okay, so the so answer to the that person, I'm just going to say you should speak to your attorney about that because you may be able to get into court, and um, it may be something that you need to deal with in court if you've been locked out of an account, um, and if you need that information for reasons of um, discovery or you don't want the other side to have it in this way, that's something to talk to your attorney about so that um, it can be dealt with properly. Um, this is a question we get all the time, Philip. Um, which is what are offshore assets and um, how is that is is it how do you go about finding them? Uh, offshore assets really mean any asset that's not in the United States. Uh, property, money, uh, cars, companies, anything that's not domiciled here in the United States is an offshore asset. And the question is very broad because, some countries actually have better disclosure than the United States. You know, even private companies uh, in, in the United Kingdom, for example, have to, have to report financials. And here, you know, here if something's in Delaware, you see nothing. You can't even see who, who owns it. But Britain has a beneficial ownership registry. Not only do you see um, how the company does, but who the beneficial, the main beneficial owners of the company are although it's self-reported and they don't audit it, but it's better than, better than what we have here. Uh, so that's one kind of, I mean, I can look and see if someone owns property in France, if someone has, a, I can do it right from my desk. And as I say, you know, you can look at tax records in, in Scandinavia. But then the other, the other, the thing people think about as offshore more are secretive companies in the British Virgin Islands, which, uh, are domiciled in the British Virgin Islands, but control assets somewhere else. People don't actually have big mansions in the British Virgin Islands. They don't have $4 million in a bank in the British Virgin Islands. It's in a bank somewhere else, but the account is in the name of, say, a company that's incorporated in the British Virgin Islands. How do you go about finding all this? The, the, first of all, you need to have a lot of money at stake before you even think about going to court for a freezing order in the British Virgin Islands. I mean, you have to put up something like a $100,000 bond just to go to court in, in Nevis, in St. Kitts, where, which is one of the, one of the, the offshore Caribbean uh, jurisdictions. These places make it expensive on purpose. That's what they do. I was at a conference at the ABA family law section, and this lawyer in Atlanta said, I set up my trusts in Bermuda on purpose because it's very expensive to go to court in Bermuda to litigate, to open that trust up, to get a freezing order. So I tell people, if you think there's a maybe 50 grand sitting around in the Caribbean, don't, don't bother. The, the thing that I often say to people usually is start onshore anyway, because it's much, much cheaper to look onshore. And you never know. I once saw an executive, uh, a European executive of a European company, but that European company had sold stock in the United States. So they had to report on the to the SEC. And his compensation was reportable on, at the SEC. And right on the form, it said, yes, his salary is this. We pay him so much personally. And the rest of it goes to this LLC. Right. Here. And so we found a company that he and now that LLC maybe transferred the money overseas. But we had a foothold as to where his money was. And this was an overseas guy. And I think maybe he also had a foreign company that, that uh, and so he would have had to pay some tax on that. But you start here. Uh, sometimes you've seen people notarize a document from a foreign jurisdiction. Oh, gee, you know, he's, he lives in Dallas, so why is, why is he notarizing uh, uh, something in Cyprus? Well, that may be because he has things going on in Cyprus. So start here, but it's... It's impossible to talk about offshore assets just in one answer because there are 160 other countries. Uh, some don't even have the concept of a public record. Others have pretty good public records and and pretty good discovery if you if you get a, a foothold in. And you know it just depends on where. The worst thing is when people say, "I think there are offshore assets. I don't know where." Because really, I mean, where in the world do you start? Uh, so it's always good if you could if you get a clue about where I think he goes to Punta Cana in Dominican Republic all the time. All right, we can get a property search going in Punta Cana with with Dominican lawyers, and we could see if he might own something. It's not something you can do online, but that's something that's at least somewhere to start. So 
the more we know about the person, uh, where they go. And our questionnaire that we give to divorced clients always says, where does the person go on vacation? Uh, you know, who does he go with? Does he does he own any property anywhere? And then it turns out, oh, yeah, you know, he has a – or he, they'll say he had a timeshare somewhere, and we find that he still owns it. They told her that he sold it, but it's still there. So those are the – I mean, in the broad, that's the broadest kind of answer I can give you, you know, for a pretty broad question. Thank you. So, um, Nick, going back to you, um, is there a particular – um, email, if, if people want to start a new email address, first of all, do you recommend that during a divorce? And then absolutely hundred percent. Okay. Why? For all the reasons we talked about before, um, an email account, if it gets compromised, okay. Generally speaking, I mean, I know people may text with their lawyer. They, might possibly be communicating with their lawyer by some form of uh, other communication platform. But generally, most clients are going to be conversing with their lawyer about important detailed things and exchanging information and documents with their lawyer by email. So in a divorce or custody battle situation, if the other party is going to go after the victim spouse, one of the things they're absolutely going after is the email. They may have used spyware and they're getting the email. They may have used spyware on some device of the victim spouse. And that device is no longer in use. It was, it was, you know, gotten rid of or whatever happened, or it got wiped and reset and the spyware no longer functions or whatever but they may have the email access credentials for the client's email account, even if they had spyware on something and it stopped working a year and a half ago, they may still have the email credentials for the Yahoo or the Gmail account. Um, so it's, it's a target, it's a primary target for the bad actor spouse. And Generally speaking, again, not because Google's security is weak or Yahoo's security is weak. It's incredibly hard to hack th that, but it's not so hard to usually compromise it. Um, and we see it all the time. So the, the thing to do is right away when you're contemplating a divorce or you just started a divorce, or you had just getting involved with the lawyer or whatever, get on a computer that you know is clean, not your laptop, not your iPad, not your phone, not any device of yours that could potentially maybe be compromised, even if you don't know for sure that you know one of them is. Get on a computer, your mom's computer, your sister's computer, your friend's computer, your coworker's computer, your computer at your office, if you work in a, you know, uh, for those of us who still go to an actual office, um, Go online and create a new email account. Gmail, Yahoo, it doesn't matter. Um, you want to use Proton Mail or one of these, that's fine too, but you don't need to. The key is to create a new, fresh email account that the other spouse doesn't know about and don't make it your name or your nickname or other things that would be easy for them to find or figure out, not even the email name. Make it something that if they saw the email address, they wouldn't even fathom that it was you. Okay. Um, and now you've set that up, right? Now uh, you're going to use that email account and only that email account for your, let's say, divorce purposes to communicate with your attorney or anyone your attorney tells you to communicate with by email. Now, this kind of gets circular and tricky. If I think you made the white paper available to people, if they read through it, they'll see what I mean. The key here now is. Now you need to get yourself set up on at least one device that you know is clean, doesn't have spyware on it. And then you have to be very, very careful after you do that to not spoil the work you just did by now going home and let's say connecting your clean device that has your nice new clean email account on it to the Wi-Fi in your house. If, for example, you're still cohabitating with the spouse who we suspect may be a bad actor, 
who has, among other things, I mean, they probably have access to the Wi-Fi. And if they live there, they've got physical access to the router and the modem in the house. And if they do, if they're tech savvy or their friend or someone they hire is very tech savvy, there are very uh, nefarious, very nasty things they can do in terms of capturing traffic over the home network. So what do you do? You get a cellular enabled iPad or a, or a laptop and uh, a, a MiFi or a hotspot from Verizon or AT&T. And we go through it in the, in the white paper, right? And you basically create for yourself this little private secure computing bubble for the duration of however long, you know, the problem situation, the divorce, the custody battle litigation is going to go on. So now you have a secure, clean laptop and a newly created email the other party doesn't know about. Um, and you're only going to access that from your computer at work and this new secure, you know, iPad or, or laptop, whatever that you've set yourself up with. And only from a, uh, uh, an internet connection that you know is safe. In other words, not your home Wi-Fi that the other party also has access to and uses, et cetera. Interesting. I, I never thought about doing that. And it's it's great advice to set up essentially your own bubble, your own internet yep. bubble is really what you're saying, Nick, that um, to make sure that you're perfectly um, safe in terms of security. Um, there's a question in the chat about walkie-talkies, um, kids coming home with walkie-talkies and whether these walkie-talkies could possibly be used to um, to spy on, um, on someone. And I'm going to ask at the same breath, because it's an issue that, can, that comes up a lot, is whether Alexa, people always want, they're asking our clients to set up these Alexas for communication. Is that some sort of a trick also? Um, I'm going to say that I've not had a case myself where we've documented an Alexa being compromised or um, uh, being, uh, you know, uh, leveraged or uh, exploited as a surveillance device. But I will say that I am aware of a number of documented cases where an Alexa uh, or similar, you know, smart assistant home device app, um, I don't want to single out Alexa, but uh, <laughs> I... Um, I'm aware of several cases where they have been hacked. And by hacked, I mean actually hacked with uh, a physical modification to the device and then the actual insertion of some malicious code or firmware into the device. And then the device has been given or deployed in the space by the bad person who has access or given. And then, yes that device now can be uh, effectively exploited as an excellent surveillance tool. Um, so I'm aware that it can happen. Um, I don't think it's all that common because it's not so easy to do, um, but I'm aware that it can happen, yes. The walkie-talkie thing. I, yeah, that's what I was just going to ask. These I've never seen it. I've seen people try and exploit just about everything. I will say I'm very well aware that some uh, quote walkie talkies, or we call them point to point radios. Um, some of them can have a range uh, at probably not in the city, but you know, in the outer suburbs area, they could have a range of easily two, three, four miles. Um, so theoretically, yeah, I mean, that could be exploited as uh, uh, some method of surveillance. And then last, um, I'm going to um, answer this one last question that's in here. If there's an open filing cabinet or a filing cabinet, okay, in a house, okay, and someone is comparing that to a computer, filing cabinets you can go into, okay, filing cabinets are open areas. If there's documentation there and you need to get those documents and you need to have them copied or you, and put them back or you need to go through them, they are up for grabs. Filing cabinets are up for grabs, okay? They are different than computers. And in fact, Nick, as I'm sure you know, there were cases at the very beginning when all of these yeah. cases came out 
about whether you could go on your spouse's computer or whether you couldn't. They actually said that if, if, if your spouse's computer at that point was open, it's like an open filing cabinet and yep. you could just go into it. So not to say that that's what you should do about a computer, but open, but filing cabinets, they're different than computers. So, you know, Feel free, frankly. Um, so we're going to send me a Liberian, a Liberian company registration that was just sitting around in a cabinet. It was wonderful, you know. Exactly. The guy, and, the, and we found out from that the guy was self-dealing at his public company. This this Liberian company was a, a vendor, and but no one knew it was he was self-dealing because no one knew it was his company except we down knew. It was great. Nick, you have one person who said that they are a social worker and they have a client who could use um, this kind of expert advice. Um, do you work in other situations be besides divorce? Uh, the, the answer is absolutely. We work in all kinds of situations. Uh, family law, yes, a lot, as you know, but we do work in commercial settings, um, you know, and personal uh, matters that have nothing to do with divorce or custody, you know, cyber stalking, uh, you know, harassment, people who are victimized in other ways, they've been a victim of a, a scam or this or that. And, and yes, uh, consulting in, in lots of other contexts. So everyone, thank you all. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Philip. This has been an incredible um, hour and, and now almost 20 minutes. And um, I, I thank you both for being such supporters of Savvy Ladies. I'm also going to give um, a shout out. I see um, Elle out there, I think, from our family wizard, who was also a sponsor previously. I don't know if she's still on, but she was on. And um, Andrea Labus, who also was a sponsor um, and a speaker on our panels. And um, so I, I give them a shout out also. Fantastic. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but fantastic company, by the way. You're, the, the other sponsor you mentioned, our family wizard. Um, because I can't tell you how frequently we get brought into a case, as you know, you know, did they send the text? They didn't send the text. I texted them, but, you know, they say I never got it, et cetera. And, you know, it's very expensive to get us involved to the, he, he did, she didn't send the text. We didn't text. They were supposed to text, et cetera. And our family wizard in the cases, you know, where they're burning, you know, they tend to avoid a lot of that. They do. They do. So thank you all. Um, Judy, do you want to um, any announcements for from you? No, just that this has been recorded and we will send it out to all the registrants as well as we will share the white paper that Nick shared um, with us. We'll send that to everyone as well as great information with everyone's contact information. Again, thank you everyone to uh, everyone for supporting Savvy Ladies and have a lovely evening. Be safe. Thank you both. Thank you, thank Philip. You thank much. you, Nick. Thank you, everyone.